This is Fenland Falls near Peterborough. And a few years ago, an aerial photographer saw some interesting crop marks here and took some photos. This is one of them, and these are the marks. They're huge, about 200 metres across from here to here. Archaeologists had a look at the photos and got very excited. They think that they're evidence of a 6,000-year-old structure, which they call a Neolithic causeway enclosure. But agreeing on a name and agreeing they're very important is the easy part. Agreeing what they're for is very different. Is this evidence of a massive farm or some kind of settlement or a ritual site? Very few of these things have ever been dug, so anything we find could help solve the puzzle. And we've got just three days to do it. The plan is to put trench one on the inner ring of the ditches on the east side and a second trench on the west side where the ring of ditches disappears under an area of thick mud left by an ancient river channel. The dark band running down the middle is mud left by a Roman canal. The geophysics team have finished surveying the areas targeted for the two trenches and the results aren't what was expected. You've got the problem, I'm afraid. This is where the in a ditch should run. We've done the geophysics and I can't see it at all. But oh, uh, there is something here, isn't there? I just think that's probably geological. Well, it shows up superbly well on the photograph. I know it does. But look at the other end well, where you can't see it. Well, that's just that black alluvial stuff, stuff isn't it? <laughs> but look at the geophysics. <laughs> it's so clear. Isn't it? I don't understand why we're not seeing it at this end mm. when it's so clear here. Finding the rings of ditches is going to be key to figuring out why Neolithic people built these monuments. What we do know is that after two million years wandering the landscape, our hunter-gatherer ancestors began a more settled existence. This change from a completely nomadic lifestyle marked the beginning of the Neolithic Age, which in Britain lasted from 4000 until 2500 BC, when metals first came into use. Causewayed enclosures were built from the very start of the Neolithic period and must have played an important role in the new way of life. Right, I think we're done at the right level here, Kerry. You can see it's good and clear. Yeah. So you see the change from the orange here to the clay. Yeah, it's very clear from up here. Is it? Yeah. I think that's your buried Neolithic soil. Right. Francis's trench on the east side and Phil's on the west side are both placed where we think the inner ring of the ditches is. If we look at these trenches in the context of the entire field, we can get our first real sense of how big the monument is. But it's not the only one discovered in this area. So this is our causeway enclosure here, and there's another one here, and one here, and one here, and yet another one here. Yet these are very rare Neolithic <laughs> phenomenon, and we've got five together. <laughs> Why is that? Well, I think it was deliberate. I think these are marking the edge, the boundary, of a really important cultural territory. Cultural, Stuart? Well, it could be cultural, it could be practical as well, because if you, if you look at this grouping, and they are very close together, they seem to relate to the Valley of the Welland. And if you look at this geological map, over here, all these pretty colours are upland. All this blank yellow out here is, is Fenland, it's bog, it's unpleasant. But all these enclosures occur where the Welland meets the bog, effectively. They're on this zone in between. So I think we've got to look at reasons why they all cluster together. So are you going to try and tie them all up for us? Well, I'd like to. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a big task. I'm going to go and look at these locations for the causeway enclosures we know about and see how they relate to the geography, how they relate to each other, see if we can somehow get back to the landscape of the Neolithic. Knowing when you found a ditch can be a bit tricky, as they are, after all, simply holes dug in the ground 6,000 years ago. It's quite ephemeral, though, the archaeology, isn't it, Phil? What do you mean, pretty vague? <laughs> yeah, basically. I mean, yeah, it is. It, it is. It is. Uh, it's very, very difficult to see. I suppose identifying it is just a result of, of observation and experience, really, isn't it? Subtle changes in the colour of the soil might be the only thing to indicate that you've come across one. And after a little more digging, that's exactly what Phil thinks he's got in Trench 2, along with some of the River Welland. What have you got here, Phil? <laughs> we got the ditch. <laughs> you don't have, look, haven't you? Don't look in that section no. because it's, it's actually sloping up. 
But on this side, damn it, you can see it, it's actually coming down there. And then it dips down here. It's very difficult to see it there. But once you get along here, you can actually see the edge very clearly against this white gravel. And then it rises up the other side. To make a ditch at Northborough, Neolithic people dug down through dark clay soil into the lighter gravelly soil underneath. We know from excavations at other causeway enclosures that they placed important objects into the ditches. Then soil from the banks was put back over them. This is what we call the backfill. When the ditch was no longer needed, the remainder of the bank would be placed back on top of it. Is there any way that we could date this tiny piece of pottery? Yeah, I mean, that's a, a very classic piece of uh, beaker pottery. Beaker as in the beaker people? As it, yeah, as in beaker, early Bronze Age, so it's around about 2,500 BC. And would this actually have been a beaker? Yeah, it's a very sort of finely made, very finely decorated drinking vessel. You sometimes get them associated with burials, but they are quite a common feature, uh, finding them as individual fragments in the top of Neolithic ditches. Only another thousand years to go and we're in the Neolithic? A thousand years straight down. The beaker style of pottery was brought here by migrants from mainland Europe. Although we can't be sure why they turn up on the top of Neolithic ditches, it could be because the monument was regarded as a special place even in the Bronze Age. The world of the ancestors obviously doesn't exist, but in their minds it did, and the ancestors were in league with something bigger and something more powerful. So by linking yourself to heroic figures in the past, you were linking yourself into God. A great deal's claimed for Neolithic causeway enclosures. According to Francis, they're monuments built in reverence to gods and ancestors. According to Ben, they're more likely to be the first farms or villages. But which is it? Or is it neither? We've found the inner ring of ditches in both our trenches, but what we haven't found is anything to help us answer these fundamental questions. Neolithic ditches are the treasure chests of their age. But we do know there are Neolithic people here because clever old Matt has found, let's have a look, about 10 minutes ago, that. Do you know what that is? Is that an arrowhead? Yeah, it is. It's a very distinctive leaf-shaped arrowhead. It's snapped across the middle. That's why it's got a flat end. And they're most commonly found in causeway enclosures. It's a beautiful find, isn't it's it? It's absolutely cracking. It's so thin and beautifully made, that lovely ripple flaking on it. A lovely thing. So at the very start of day two, we've got our first Neolithic find. Leaf-shaped arrowheads were made from the very early Neolithic period at around 4000 BC. This one was either broken while being made or during hunting. It was found outside a ditch in Trench 2 and was most likely just thrown away. The all-important placed objects will be inside the ditches. And now that we've found them, Francis helps Matt mark out an area to dig. We're digging the inside. That's right, yeah. So anything from the interior will be in this side of the ditch. I think it's going to be the best bit to dig. If these monuments were part of a transition to a more settled lifestyle, we'd expect to find evidence of a Neolithic village here. In Phil's trench, Matt has been digging down through the layers of a ditch. There's not a lot of finds so far, but one of them takes us back to the very beginnings of pottery. Well, it's not exactly the crown jewels, is it? Uh, well, no, I think it is for, for the Neolithic. Um, it's quite nice. We've, we've got uh, fragments of uh, pottery come out. We've got this little sort of rim uh, with these decoration on it. Uh, and and is that definitely Neolithic? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. That looks, looks like it's a piece of uh, Mildenhall ware. This is the first sort of pottery vessel that we see in the British Isles. It's quite coarse, and to our eyes, it's, it's very basic, but this is state-of-the-art uh, domestic product for the Neolithic. And all these bits? Um, we've got nice bits of firecrack flint, all that sort of crazy lines on it suggest it's been in the middle of a hearth, in the middle of a very intense fire. Where did all this come from? Well, we think we've got the end of the ditch here, so we concentrate on that, and it's all coming from uh, the top layer of it there, where, where all the charcoal and burnt door was. Um, if we get down in deeper, hopefully we might find some more, more meaty stuff. Mildenhall ware was made from about 3,600 BC. They were round-bottomed pots, decorated with simple lines and dots on the rim and sides. This find gives us the first firm evidence the causeway enclosure at Northborough was in use from the very beginnings of the Neolithic age. I think we've got uh, what looks like the remains of a pot with some sort of um, burnt material in it. Ooh. Yeah, it's like sort of 
wet digestive biscuit. Yeah, it's gone back to mud. It can't go back to being mud unless it's very, very poorly fired. Right. Very poorly fired. But it, is it actually on the bottom of the ditch? That's the bottom there. It was really yeah. hard. Yeah. So it's yeah. nearly there. Oh, yes, it's pretty well on the bottom, yeah. That's interesting. You've got a pot on the bottom of the ditch near the centre. It's got charred grain in it. It doesn't look much now, but I reckon we're looking there at a deliberately placed offering. This is a forearm bone. It goes right there. Oh, right. And um, this, looking at it, has been split while the animal has just been newly killed. It's hit it with a rock or something right at that point and split this side wall of the bone off right. to expose all the marrow inside. And they used to eat a lot of marrow in those days, so you find a lot of bones like this. Is it being cooked? I would think not before it's had the side knocked off to get the marrow out, because that would cause the marrow to dissolve. So I think this has been done just after the animal's been skinned and butchered. Francis's trench is providing our first clues about what Neolithic people did here. The offering pot at the bottom of a ditch is evidence for Francis's ritual activity. But the cattle bones suggest there was domesticated cattle kept here, which supports Ben's view that this was a farm. As yet, there's not enough evidence to prove either theory. Stuart has now combined his knowledge of the Neolithic enclosures he visited with what we know about the one at Northborough. This is the best understanding we have of the monument in its landscape at the time. So it really is quite a lonely situation surrounded by water channels with only a few dry land approaches to it at most v times of the Very year. much so, yeah. I mean, one of the objectives we set out from here was to try and look at this monument against the background of all these other causeway enclosures here, the five in, in this grouping, which seemed quite unusual. If you look at these other enclosures, can you see up at Barham, its visibility is restricted in that direction. Can't see anything in that direction at all, but you can actually see in a cone down to the river. At Uffington, it's exactly the same. See how it collects the river, as it were, in that direction, but there's no visibility that way. So really, they're all looking down onto sort of waterways, and Etna and Northborough are also in very watery situations, as we've just seen from Henry's reconstruction. Exactly. But do you think they're all contemporaries, do you? Um, my guess is that they are. I mean, one thing that makes me think that is the commonality of shape. They've all got this very strong oval shape. Mm. And what makes it particularly interesting that Northborough's actually got more rings than the others. And that's the furthest east along the Welland. And it just makes me wonder if that's kind of as far as they were reaching out and this one had specific monumentality that they wanted to implant on the landscape. Phil's perseverance has been rewarded with an important last-minute find. Well, what have you got? Wow, what have I got? Gordon Bennett, where did this come from? Oh, it's just down in the bottom of the ditch there. This is the best bone we've had yet. Do you is know what it? this is? Well, no, I wouldn't ask you if I did. No, you wouldn't. <laughs> this is an aurochs. What? Wild cattle. It's the only one we've seen so far. This is incredible. This is a distal fit. It goes right there in me, and it's about four times as big. This has never been domesticated. This is a wild animal through and through. How frequently do they turn up on causeway enclosures? Uh, not very often, let's put it that way. It's a nice thing to find. It's very special. Well, you see, it, it, you, you know, you're kind of saying how important it is. The place where we found it is special. Why because is it's right at the bottom of the ditch. It's right in the middle between the two ends. That's this right. did not happen by accident. This it has been put seem... here quite deliberately. It does seem just too much it's of a... It's too much of a coincidence. That is a Too much, much of a coincidence. I'd better go and find some more. Made my day. <laughs> <laughs> Aurochs were hunted in the Neolithic period, but must have been quite a challenge to kill. They were formidable beasts, built like a Spanish fighting bull, but twice the size. At the start of our dig of the causeway enclosure at Northborough, we had two opposing views about what Neolithic people did here. Francis argued it was a place for rituals revering the ancestors and gods, while Ben thought it was where Britain's first farmers gathered in their resources. So after all this archaeology, are you still convinced that essentially this is a big farm? Well, look, we've got enhanced magnetism in the ditches here. This is burning. This is uh, debris and, and charcoal from settlement being dumped into the top of ditches. On the interior of the enclosure, again, the anomaly is raised by the burning here, so it comes out as, as yellow. The phosphates, too, show that we've got animals being driven into the enclosure. 
pulled outside and then driven in. So, you know, I think it's pretty compelling. <laughs> compelling? Um, superficially, yes, but the burning on the interior would fit beautifully with people using this seasonally, clearing off the, the, the vegetation and then getting on with their religious you know, activities. It does stretch credibility somewhat, doesn't it, to think that this huge earth monument with these massive ditches around it was built simply to be a farm. Well, not a farm, but a place where resources are pulled into. They dominated a wide area of this landscape. They are farming it and they're bringing the resources back here. I, I just don't think you let your cows into church, do you? And you don't <laughs> let them poo in church when they're there. That's a point, isn't it? Aren't you simply importing a theory which works well in other sites where they have found ritual deposits and sticking it here where they haven't found any? <laughs> well, I'd contest the, the fact they haven't found any. We've got that half-fired pot, which doesn't make any sense, uh, full of charred grain right in the bottom of the ditch, and that aurochs bone, which is placed absolutely on the bottom of the ditch, right in the middle. And that thing is a deliberate placement so are you prepared to concede that there might be a ritual element here? Well, look, I think in everyday life there's an element of ritual that, that creeps in and I think we can pick that up through archaeology. So I'm prepared to concede that they were doing things that were not wholly practical all of the time. <laughs> and are you prepared to concede <laughs> that there was probably some farming going on here? <laughs> of course. And I, I think what really worries me, Tony, yeah. I think if we continue this discussion for another two or three minutes, we might end up agreeing so I think we should no, stop. Let's stop now. <laughs> cut, cut. <laughs> the Causewayed enclosure at Northborough was the grandest of the group in the area. It was situated on an island surrounded by lush fenland and river channels and seems to have been built in two phases. The inner ring of ditches was built first at the very start of the Neolithic age, while the smaller ditches of the outer rings were added later. The light gravelly soils of the banks would have stood out against the landscape and could have been seen from a great distance. The effect of the whole monument would have been very dramatic. No other great monuments came before it. No other man-made structures competed with it. Time Team is 100% independent and funded by our incredible fans. Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models, masterclasses, and more. Please join us on this exciting journey. We need more support to make more episodes. Henry III began to build Westminster Abbey in 1245. It was one of the most expensive building projects of the Middle Ages and set Westminster on course to be the political center of London. Whenever there's talk of a time team coming to London, you back off. That's London. right. But you're yeah. here. Because of Westminster Abbey, you know, it is the great Benedictine Abbey in the country, one of the biggest. We're looking for a sacristy. Yeah. Now, yeah. Am I right in saying that that's the room where they kept all the stuff for the services? Yeah, where they kept the, uh, the chalices and patterns and where the, the copes for the clergy to wear are kept, where all the paraphernalia really for the services is kept, so a really important room. Warwick. Do we have any idea where this sacristy actually is? Yes, um, the, the, the sacristy, or what they thought was the sacristy, was discovered by accident in 1869 when uh, Sir Gilbert Scott was working on this area and repairing the building and, the, and particularly this north porch and they lowered the ground level all round this side and bumped into walls and this is the plan they produced it. That's in this area yep. here, it, this L it's, shape it's, in here from the right door to the north yep. porch. So do we think it's all still here? Just under the grass? Well, we, we hope it is still there, but <laughs> there, is, there is a little hitch in that um, Scott also ordered the construction of a vaulted chamber down here um, in, in this area, and then it was demolished again not many years later. We've suddenly been overcome by gloom. We're not going to find <laughs> anything, are we? No, no, I think it's extremely unlikely that they dug everything out. And if we did find the sacristy? If we found Henry III's sacristy, that would be absolutely fantastic. You'd be happy? I would be very happy. Please do it. <laughs> <laughs> Better get on, then. Even if the walls are still there, we're a bit worried they may be nothing to do with the sacristy. 
because incredibly, later in the post-medieval period, there were houses and workshops built right up against the abbey on the same footprint as the supposed sacristy. Where do we think our sacristy is? We're ours. We think he's this L-shaped building north of the nave and where the north transept is. There is another one, of course. Where? Down here. That's the more normal place to find it. Off the south transept, right at the point where you can all troop in with all the vestments and, and, and gear into the east end of the church, right next to the chapter. So that's where you'd expect it. It's really hard to have a second one, and it's very hard to have it in that position there. If we did find it, how important would that be? Oh, I think it would be enormously significant. Would it be fair to call it a find of national importance? Oh, yes, do? yes. I mean, it's a, it would be a major find for church archaeology, no doubt about mm. that. Westminster Abbey's sumptuous design nearly bankrupted Henry III when he built it in the 13th century. Most of it's still standing, but there's one important room missing, his great sacristy. Despite terrible weather on day one, by the afternoon, Phil's found some walls, although he's not convinced they're anything to do with the sacristy. When you look at the stonework, it looks very fresh. I can't really believe that it is the sacristy. No, it, it, it definitely isn't, not yet. But then you tell me it is not part of this much, much later cellar that we know appears on the plans. If you look at those plans, you can see the wall line coming out here. That's to that point there, and it shows the cellar on this side. And if you look at the radar, the radar shows the cellar here. There's no doubt about that. I think that feature there might be stairs going into the cellar. That's... Do we care about this cellar if it's much later? Yes, what we've got to do is establish where we are on this plan. So if we can prove those are stairs, then we know that we're on the money. The dig's really beginning to get underway now. Phil expands the trench to check whether John's right about the position of the cellar. <laughs> That's not very old, Phil. And once we've located the walls on Scott's plan, we can start to work out whether or not they belong to Henry's sacristy. Well, I reckon whether you like it or not... Concrete capping? That's as far as you're going to go down for a while. We're going to need some pretty convincing archaeological evidence, because on paper, this building looks nothing like an archetypal sacristy, which should be tucked away securely in the heart of the abbey. This is the original sacristy, which was built even before the one that we're excavating for. But what is it about this place that defines it as a sacristy? Well, sacristies have to be very secure because they have all these valuable treasure in them. So the door that you have just come through uh, was originally three doors, one beside another, lots of bolts, lots of locks. Then the walls are very substantial, there's a stone vault on the roof, there are no doors, no windows that lead to the exterior. So it's a highly secure space. You've then got these arches in the wall, you see, so you could set cupboards in with the chalices and patterns, uh, you know, gold and silver, and they could have been locked. So that's more security as well. But virtually everything that you've told me that defines a sacristy is hanging off the walls. Well, when we dig down, we're not going to find any walls, so it's going to be difficult for our archaeologists specifically to identify what they've got as a sacristy. Well, that's where we have to um, try and marry the archaeological evidence with uh, documentary evidence uh, and study it in a general sense from, no, from what we know uh, elsewhere. Uh, it, it will not uh, turn out to be a building like this with a great vault on it. That could explain the size of the sacristy, but it certainly doesn't explain its puzzling location. Right, this trench has really come on. I mean, we, Phil we... thinks he's found two features shown on the plan, which he reckons are entrances to the Victorian cellar. So we've moved over here, and look, we've just come down onto this with this layer of concrete. Wonderful, because I think that is the roof of the vaulted chamber that was built by Sir Gilbert Scott. And we have the accounts telling us about building the vaults and then concreting over the top of them. OK, so far so good, but the crucial question is, is this the medieval wall? I mean, it certainly doesn't look like it. Down here, it's actually got bricks in it. 
Yeah, it doesn't look like it yet, but the medieval building was reconstructed as a house, and, there, and hence it, it, we've got post-medieval brickwork on the foundations. So you I think, think that if we go down, if we can go down yep. beyond, lower down that wall, we should actually find the line we, of the medieval we wall? We should hit the medieval wall um, below that, yeah. Our search for the sacristy is complicated by so many centuries of usage reflected in the finds. A bit of Tudor green, which comes in about 1380, but most of it's 15th century. Can uh, you see that thing? Yeah, it's beautiful. So it's really, really finely potted and, and, and highly fired. And also a bit of medieval floor tile. Now, yeah. that could easily be 14th century. Yeah. So it's about the only stuff we're getting from the medieval period so far. But I see there's an awful lot of bone in this tray, isn't there? Yeah, I mean, some of it's, some of it's animal bone, but we also have human bone and there's bits of finger bone, oh, and that's a bit of somebody's big toe there. Well, this so, is all kicking around in the top side, Yeah, it's, it's all just redeposited and it's fractured and broken. But also what we've got are these, they're like little brass studs, and they're the kind of thing that you've got in the top of usually 18th century coffins as decorative stud work. Yeah. So, you know, the fact we've got both these and the bones suggests that we've got at least 18th century burials that have mm. been disturbed. So there's clearly a lot of history to sift our way through before we can find out what was going on here in the 13th century. When Henry built his great abbey, his centrepiece was the shrine to his idol, Edward the Confessor, who'd been canonised a century before. So important was this memorial to him that Henry gave instructions for his own tomb to be placed next to it. This was one of the great shrines of England um, to which pilgrims came from far and wide and their aim was to come and to see and to touch and to uh, get spiritual um, power from the body of Edward the Confessor um, who's inside here. And that's what the steps are for here and these niches. So you, you would kneel and pray at the niche. Contemporary accounts describe this in really splendid terms. They talk about it glistening and gleaming. I don't want to be rude, but it is slightly dull now. What we see today is the stone shell made of perfect marble, uh, which is the frame that held all the decorative detail. So is it the naughty pilgrims who've been picking off all these bits of glass, then? Well, I'm afraid that it is. Um, uh, initially pilgrims, but later on visitors, I think, in later centuries. But you've got a bit left over we've there. Got, we've got a bit left there. I mean, that is a, a, a hint of what it looked like. And you must think of that over the whole of this. Everything was full of this glistening detail. And so it would have glowed as a great beacon. Henry was an avid collector of relics, such as a thorn of Christ's crown, an impression of his feet from the ascension, as well as a grisly array of saints' bones. It's no wonder he needed a supersized sacristy. And we might just have the first signs of it in the ground. Some, somehow or another, there's something running out that way. And this wall lines up with that one and Phil Strange, doesn't Exactly it? on line. Yeah. yeah. The Abbey it. was built nearly 800 years ago, and I think we've got just about every one of those 800 years represented in this trench. But very importantly, we've got a couple of finds which could well come from the very early years of the Abbey. What are they, Paul? We've got a couple of bits of medieval pottery. It's Kingston ware, and it's absolutely what you'd expect to find in London between about 1230 and about 1260, 1270. This building was supposedly built in 1245, so this brackets it beautifully. This was going to be one of Henry III's chapels. It's 50 feet above the floor of the abbey, but it was never finished because these high chapels went out of fashion. But I've come up here to show you how much this part of Westminster is at the epicentre of English royal power. Over across there is the Houses of Parliament, and underneath that was the old Palace of Westminster, which was Henry's favourite palace. He actually lived there. And in those days, there was no road there. There was just a wall. So he'd come out of his palace, through a little gate in the wall, straight to here. It was like having a very large office at the bottom of your garden. Living in the palace also meant that Henry could keep an eye on his builders. And in Phil's trench, we're getting an idea of the logistics of constructing his great abbey. 
But we can now see that this war here, which we've always been calling medieval and which we still think is medieval, is actually built on the raft and is actually butts up against the basal course of the main abbey. So it is of a later date. We still think it's medieval, but later medieval than the construction of the abbey itself. But what is new and very interesting is that you can see that this is actually part of a wall. And you can see there's got an edge running across there. And that face is actually visible continuing in here. Do you see yeah. there's this little raised yeah. step of mortar? Yeah. And that implies that there was once a wall coming across here blocking off between these two buttresses apart from the main wall that we know was running from east to west. I mean, there isn't really a major Roman site right near the abbey, is there? Not right near the abbey, no, but the theory is it could well have come from the earliest phase of abbey building and then it's just been incorporated into walls much later on. It's a fab thing to find, though. That's really nice. <laughs> Everybody involved in the Abbey is on tenterhooks to find out what else we can discover about this historic site in the final hours of the dig. Jackie's already identified several burials, including an eight-year-old child. Their alignment and level suggest that they're probably from the time of Edward the Confessor. But what we really want is to pin down a date for the chalk-lined burial. This has definitely been disturbed by the Victorians. Has it? Yeah, this is all Victorian backfill that's in here. And this means that any finds from the grave might be misleading. Usually finds are vital clues for us, and this dig has produced vast quantities, which the students of Westminster School are helping us process. What we need is something datable from the very bottom of the grave. That looks more like a bit of tile or brick to me. That's not pottery. But you can't give us a date on it. Hey, it's tile or brick, mate. It's not my job, I'm afraid. <laughs> Sorry. The good news is that now we can see the chalk-lined grave, it's clearly on a totally different alignment to the later burials. So this ought to be associated with an early and, uh, Saxon church. Exactly. That would be incredible, It would it? be fantastic. And in order to be able to work out the date of the building to which this grave relates, what we need to do is to take a small sample of bone from the leg and have that radiocarbon dated. We've had quite a journey here at Westminster Abbey. We came here to find Henry III's lost sacristy, and in doing so, we've discovered it had a totally unique role. It was the backstage area for the spectacular royal processions that were at the very heart of Henry's groundbreaking design. But the totally unexpected find was the first evidence of an early Saxon church, which we now think was built on a different orientation. Because the carbon date suggests our burial dates from the early 11th century, earlier than Edward the Confessor. Time Team is 100% independent and funded by our incredible fans. Want us to make more episodes? Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews 3D models, masterclasses, and more. And you get to have your say in the process as we develop new sites. This is the Kissing Gate of St Kyneburgers Church here in the village of Caster in Cambridgeshire. And it's one of the most beautiful medieval churches in England. And yet it's what's under this church's graveyard that's got our archaeologists very excited because beneath my feet could be the remains of a mysterious Roman building. But it's not just one Roman building by itself. Over there in the school playing field, across there in the rectory. In fact, everywhere I look, archaeologists have found impressive Roman structures. This could add up to be something very special. Looks like it's going to be a hectic three days. That is, if I can never get down again. And over the last 400 years, antiquarians, archaeologists, and even grave diggers have been discovering nuggets of Castor's intriguing past. Ben, you've been here before, haven't you? You're an old friend of William and his grave diggers. Yes, I used to look after the archaeology in this area, so yes, I know William well. <laughs> Why? Why did you keep coming here? Well. Every time a grave was dug, a mass of Roman material would come out. So, you know, it, it was obviously of interest and something that I ought to be concerned about. This kind of stuff? Absolutely. I'm, I'm just an enthusiastic amateur, but even I can recognise 
distinctive Roman material like this, tegula, a piece of Roman tile with its ridge, a piece of pili, Roman hippocorse bricks. Are you happy about us digging in your graveyard? Absolutely. It, it doesn't seem quite right. No, this area has not been dug in before. There are no bodies buried here. Well, this, this strip along Absolutely. here? Absolutely. Yeah. But even without any graves, Geophys will still need to scan this narrow strip of churchyard before we open any trenches. We're also surveying the playing field of the next door school, as this is where an intriguing 19th century antiquarian said he found some Roman baths. Our digger gets trench number one underway. See, what we're getting is lots of reflections close to the surface. John's a bit confused. His radar was showing very little here, but we've barely scratched the surface and we've got archaeology. Which could be that, but... we just just forget that? Yeah, I am forgetting it. This is reality. This will tell us whether there's anything there. Is that Roman? Already, pieces of Roman mosaic flooring called tessera are turning up. Back outside, it's now raining cats and dogs on our archaeologists in Trench One. <laughs> Thank you so much. But despite the weather and the geophys results, this trench is turning into something of a gold mine. We got some finds for. We're getting loads of finds out already. This is just a selection. There's this stuff, which is kind of Saxo-Norman, dates the 11th, early 12th century, around about the time the church was built. So they were quite possibly robbing out the Roman buildings for stone to build the church. And we've got our first bit of early Middle Saxon handmade pottery, five, six, seven centuries, something like that. What about this chunky stuff here? Well, we've got Roman as well. There's some bits of Roman colour-coated pottery, which is late third, fourth. Bit of a mosaic tessera as well, possibly. Cracking selection of finds already. It looks like there's something coming out of the trench, Phil. Yeah, well, this is the crucial thing, Tony. As Paul says, we are beginning to get Saxon pottery. These are the first levels that we're actually coming down onto. They could include Saxon buildings here. This is really rather extraordinary for us. We always have a problem finding Saxon on time team. To find it, great, but then to find it on the site where we're looking for Roman is a little bit more difficult. What do we find next? So we're going to open our second trench here in the old rectory garden. And after some promising geophys, we've decided to put a third trench in this corner of the school field. This is another spot that our antiquarian artists and later archaeologists have explored. And it seems to have been an artist's favourite because he drew the remains of this impressive Roman bathhouse he reckoned he'd found here. If so, our trench in the old rectory garden could be right on top of one. But if Artis's plan is accurate, it's the north graveyard where we really need to focus our efforts. So Jim is now geophysing here. And by mid-afternoon, he's latched onto something. Um, you've turned up just at the right time. Look at this. We've got a really strong reflector here, and it's at least five metres across. Well, that's nothing like anything else in the churchyard, is it? No, no, up until now, I mean, there's been the odd reflection, but they've looked like um, they could just be stone casket or a slab-lined grave. But, I mean, this is much, much bigger, and it's about halfway up the slope, just beyond where this mess is. Well, this is where the one building was meant to be from antiquarian records, where they got this early mosaic. It's possible Jim has detected this striking Roman yeah. mosaic floor that artists drew in his book of illustrations. And if our antiquarian site plan is to be trusted, it makes sense that geophys are getting a strong signal here. There must have been something here for them to rob and raid to use. Yeah. What are yeah. you guys doing here? All the excitements on the far side of the church. You're stuck around the back. Yeah, but we've been looking at all the Roman stuff built into the church, the tile and the stonework and so on, and the idea that it comes from a huge Roman building that's somewhere round here, the back of the church. Artists had a theory that all the Roman buildings to the north of the church were one giant structure. And Stephen thinks this is how it might have looked. Well, it's a pretty enormous building, Tony. I mean, from where we're standing to the far side, it's 110 metres. Crikey. Well, if it's that big, it would absolutely dwarf the church, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would. It would be three or two or three times bigger than the church. So what could something that size actually be? Let's go back to Artis. He called it a praetorium. What's a praetorium? Well, in artists' terms, he were used to digging villas of fairly modest size, and this was the biggest thing that he ever saw and ever dug. 
and he gave the term praetorium, implying its size. We've only got one day, Ben. Yeah. What do you think our overall strategy should be? Well, I think Artis was very good archaeologist for his time, but I'm, I'm not so confident about this sort of floating building here. Yeah, is yeah. it attached to the other buildings around it? What alignment is it on? We need a trench across there to try and yeah. tie it to the other buildings and sort out the alignment. Yeah. Then I think we need to do something similar in the west part of the churchyard, just here. Now, a few That's years where you can see that wall in the path. Yeah. Well, yeah. a few years ago, I cleaned up a bit of wall there, and there's definitely something there, but I didn't yeah. get much of a look at no. it. Is that a big building range, as artist depicts it? And I'm off up there now. <laughs> so Phil's on the move. To this spot, just north of the church, to help Jackie dig a new trench in the graveyard. And Rakshar's opening a trench as well, in the area that Ben's interested in. With over 20,000 burials in this churchyard, it's not going to be easy finding any evidence for our praetorium. But in the rectory garden trench, which Faye's now taken over from Matt, we may be onto something. What have you actually got going on over there, Tim? Well, I seem to have this surface. It's got a few tesserae in it, but it's very pebbly and not very good. Now, that's what's interesting, because where I am, I've got nothing. I've got a great big rectangular hole with no archaeology in it, and my only explanation for that can be that this is where Artis shoved his trench, and he basically took everything away with him. And therefore, that's why we've got this line along here, which I think is a robbed out wall. Everywhere on this site, we seem to be following in the footsteps of this chap, Artis. Some of us, quite literally. I need some measurements from this line now so I can put them on the drawing. Oh, excuse me, excuse me, beg your pardon. You're on time, Matthew. How? I think the pegs come out. Who put the peg in, Matthew? Sorry, sir, it went up and again. That's your wages, Dot. Yes, Mr Ainsworth. Right, next, the rectory garden next, Matthew. Anything you say, Mr Ainsworth? <laughs> Back in the graveyard, Phil and Jackie are up against the clock, digging carefully around lots of human bones. They've now only a few hours left to get down to the floor of a potentially massive Roman structure. Are these individual burials, or are they lots of bones on top of each other? Well, we've, we've had a lot of loose bones spread about, turning up all the way across here. But the difference here is, you can see we've got about five skulls all dumped in together in one place. So you do think that that could be a grave digger who's cleared earlier graves, dug a pit, chucked these in so that more people can be buried? Yeah, I mean, basically, it looks like a charnel pit. But we do have a problem, don't we, that we've got lots of bones and lots of smashed mosaic but no structures whatsoever. What we can be certain of is that in places, the grave diggers have been through the Roman floor. Otherwise, we wouldn't have this sort of material. What we've got to hope is that they didn't destroy it all and that they've left some of it for us. And that means digging deeper? That means digging deeper. Thankfully, Rakshar's trench at the western end of the graveyard looks to have got something more substantial. Oh, How's it going? It's going very well, actually. Um, put this trench in here to find what we thought was a wall coming through yeah. there. And uh, lo and behold, we have a huge wall. <laughs> that was actually poking out of the ground before was, you started, wasn't it? It was, we it? knew that was there, <laughs> but I didn't realise how massive it actually is. So we've got one wall here, mm -hmm. which is in running in that direction. And then where John is, we have the return, and that's running in this direction. So they should actually come out and converge around about here. It's amazing, isn't it? This is the first time that we have seen anything like the kind of monumental walls that Edmund Artis saw. Yeah, this is the, this is the only trench where we actually have huge walls. Mm. Mm. In the old rectory garden, where we're looking for what could be the east wing of our praetorium, we now have two trenches. But our main hopes lie with these trenches in the graveyard. Rakshar's at the western edge, and Phil's just north of the church. Phil, you know how I said I was getting a lot more building material and big blocks of tessera? Oh, wow. Now I'm getting lots of pea grit, which is coming, this fine grit, and look what it's coming down onto. Oh, good Lord. That looks like a floor. It looks very like a floor. And this is an in situ burial. That's lying directly on top of it by the look of it. Oh, that is good stuff. I'll tell you what. Blimey. 
we could be just inches away from finally getting evidence of a big Roman structure. And crucially, it's slap bang in the middle of our Praetorian plan. Back in the old rectory garden, Faye's getting really stuck in. Cool, Hi. this looks a bit different to yes. yesterday. You're well down. I am, but fantastically, we've got a huge, great big section it's of wall. It's a big Roman wall, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, without a shadow of that. And we were a bit worried yesterday about the sort of relative heights of all this. I mean, there's a, there's a surface very much higher than the Roman wall. You can see where our artist put his trench, which is basically this line down in this section here. And I actually think that level there is where he was standing. <laughs> really? Yeah, which is why it's so compact. With footprints? Human, what size boots did he have? Come You're on, so come demanding. on. You're so demanding. I haven't got any <laughs> footprints in there. And it's also a very significant chunk of walling on the eastern side of what we think is one single enormous building. Faye's discovery of this massive Roman wall, previously dug by artists, is a really good sign. Maybe we can rely on our antiquarian after all. Meanwhile, there's breaking news from the graveyard. We've spent the last 36 hours poking around in this graveyard, trying to get permissions to dig it, getting permissions to dig it, then finding nothing but Roman rubble and a tumble of old bones. But at last, Phil, we've got something exciting, haven't we? We have got Artis's floor. Look, if you look down between that pair of legs, you can see a mosaic floor actually in situ. You're smiling, William. I'm really excited about this. If Artis is right about this, he might be right about the Praetorium. Here we are. They took Jesus from the house of Caiaphas, esto Praetorium, to the Praetorium. In Artis's day, he would have heard the word Praetorium when he went to church because that was the word used to describe them where Jesus was arraigned in front of Pontius Pilate. So he was tried in the Praetorium? In the Praetorium. But go on. I was going to say, this is so important to what we're trying to do. We've now got the floor. You can actually begin to see some sort of an alignment on the tessery. We might be able to actually say exactly what the alignment of that building was. Finally, our efforts in the graveyard are being rewarded. Raksha, this is awesome. I love this. <laughs> this is fantastic. It looks a lot different than it did yesterday. It, it, it is. It's a lot, lot different. Rakshar's revealed a huge section of wall and a step foundation. The classic herringbone style shows that this is definitely Roman. People were a bit sceptical yesterday. I talked about finding this big herringbone wall and, and I, I suspect that people didn't quite believe me. <laughs> <laughs> this looks remarkably similar to what was found on the other side of the church in the 50s. Yes, I remember that. I've seen photographs. Yeah, it. it's on a similar line, and he found step foundations like this. This is a photo of those step foundations excavated at Castor in the 1950s. They're more than 100 metres away from our trench, but they're virtually identical to those found by Rakshar. And as the last few hours of our dig at Castor tick by, the news just gets better and better. So what's the story of this trench then, Faye? Basically, we have a Roman building, and actually down there we've got a room with what looks like a hypercore system. We've actually got a two-level building. So what did they do? Fill it in or cover it up and then build something on top? Or they had stairs that took you up to another room. Ah, right, right, right. A building on two levels makes sense, because the Romans had to factor in the slope of a hill here in the old rectory garden and on the western side of the church. The massive Roman wall that Rakshar found at the western end of the graveyard, nearly two metres wide, was built to support a building possibly three storeys high. And at an extraordinary 110 metres in length, this is the largest Roman building Time Team has ever excavated. Hello, my name's John Gator. Time Team is fan funded by Patreon. This vital support helps us to make new episodes. Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models and masterclasses, plus lots more.